By the 2400s, human civilization is recognizable, yet alien. We have not just become a solar system civilization, but changed the very concept of being human. We live for centuries, with the oldest among us having been born in the late 20th and early 21st centuries, as aging is no longer a factor. Artificial intelligence is the backbone of modern civilization, but never truly replaced us, as we adapted and merged with our creations. The solar system is a tapestry of diverse societies, shaped by humanity's expansion and the transition from megacorporations and oligarchies to more egalitarian systems. Yet as humanity spreads across the stars, new ideological divides emerge. The most prominent among these are humanism and syntheticism, which clash over one central issue, the role of artificial intelligences in society. Humanists advocate for strict regulations of AI and not permitting them to act independently. Their societies depend on sentient AI companions with rapid access to all publicly available data that people can communicate with instantly in their minds. Syntheticists, on the other hand, champion the use of cognitions, sentient artificial intelligences that function independently and can make decisions on their own with less human oversight. These evolving ideologies play a crucial role as humanity ventures beyond the solar system. But how did we get here? As mentioned in part 1 and 2 of this series, which I recommend watching first. This is the concept. I usually do alternate history, and this video is not very different. Instead of going back and changing an event, I'm going forward with a set of parameters, crafting a version of our future. The parameters were originally that reusable rockets lower launch costs, the world becomes multipolar driving competition, and that self-sufficiency in space as a result becomes a major goal of the world's superpowers. This self-sufficiency on the moon at first provides a cheap launching off point to the rest of the solar system. Our search for habitable worlds and potential life beyond Earth would already in the 21st century give an approximate answer to the Fermi Paradox. Around our nearest star, Proxima Centauri, early data and images revealed barren worlds stripped of any semblance of an atmosphere by billions of years of intense radiation and powerful solar storms. Red dwarf stars, the most common type of stars, just as theorized, seem to be poor hosts for habitable planets. Around the nearby sun-like stars Alpha Centauri A and B, images showed no planets. It seemed that due to the two stars orbiting so closely, their planets were thrown out early in the system's formation. So binary stars, which account for most star systems, too seem to be a poor host for habitable worlds due to their instability. Around Ran, or Epsilon Eridani, a young, slightly dimmer but relatively sun-like star, we found a few newly formed planets, but due to the system's low metallicity, none of these were terrestrial. Nearby Tau Ceti, an older sun-like star with higher metallicity, we too found several planets in stable orbits, but they were much larger than Earth, unsuitable for settlement. 82G Eridani had many terrestrial planets, but all were closer to Venus or Mars than Earth. Delta Pavanus, an older sun-like star only 20 light-years away, would prove to be the most promising nearby system, with Delta Pavanus 3, named Aquila, and 5, named Ares, but right in between, Delta Pavanus 4, named Eos, would turn out to be the most Earth-like planet ever found. 70% Earth's surface gravity, 21-hour days, only 8 degrees Celsius warmer than Earth on average, a non-breathable but still 23% Earth pressure atmosphere, and most significantly, liquid lakes on the surface, which with later probes would turn out to have simple microbial life. Whilst incredibly similar to Earth, Eos is no paradise. The planet is incredibly dry with only small, extremely salty surface lakes that regularly dry up. This made it very difficult for life to evolve in the first place, and impossible for larger animals or plants to evolve. These early discoveries would prove to be the beginning of a trend as we looked increasingly further into the galaxy. Only a small percentage of stars are suitable for somewhat Earth-like planets, and only some of those stars happen to even form them. Tough microorganisms are relatively common on these, but the vast majority of planets with life are either too dry, too cold, or too geologically active or inactive to form complex life before a major cataclysm or change in the environment. We're a case of survivor's bias. Other civilizations almost certainly exist across the vast universe. They're just nowhere near us. In the year 2273, much of the solar system, particularly the moons of the outer planets, were a patchwork of tiny states centered around individual moons. Nevertheless, the solar system had remained mostly peaceful since humanity's expansion into the void. Never did it come to direct war between superpowers, celestial war, or nuclear war. The cold peace that spanned the solar system was built on the understanding of mutually assured destruction. But it would not be the major powers, with their robust AI systems, bureaucratic procedures, which would start the first celestial war. 
Lysithea and Alara, minor, independent moons in distant orbits around Jupiter, had long simmered with tension. Lysithea, a strict humanist society founded on anti-AI principles, relied on human oversight for all its systems. Lara, by contrast, was a highly automated society, its defense and industrial systems guided by sophisticated AI. Both had settlements on the tiny moon Carpo, which had rich deposits of platinum group metals critical for fusion reactors and magnetic radiation shielding. The rivalry between Lysithea and Alara escalated when it was discovered that Lysithea had secretly developed nuclear weapons, violating interplanetary treaties. The revelation pushed Alara to develop its own arsenal for deterrence. The breaking point came when the recently elected radical nationalist Jacob Holloway came to power on Lysithea. Almost as soon as he entered office, he ordered a first strike. The attack erased 95% of Alara's population and widened the conflict as the system's major power Callisto intervened, sealing Lysithea's fate. Lysithea, now vulnerable, acted irrationally in its desperation. Lysithean loyalists operating covertly managed to disable orbital defense systems in much of Callisto's northern hemisphere, allowing for the single most devastating bombardment in human history. Callisto responded with a gigaton nuclear strike that quite literally shattered Lysithea, and that would be the end of the most devastating war in human history. In the aftermath, Callisto took decisive action. A Jovian Commonwealth was established, uniting all Jovian colonies under a single organization to prevent future conflicts. Even with advancements in propulsion, interstellar voyages remained monumental undertakings. With fusion drives capable of maintaining a constant 0.1g acceleration, the fastest ships can travel to our nearest star systems in a matter of decades. These early interstellar settlers create entirely new human cultures forged in the void as they embark on their journeys. Some live out the decades on these ships as aging is no longer a factor, and others periodically hibernate. Most colony ships have only between a couple hundred to a couple thousand passengers. This would normally not be enough to start a civilization, but millions of human embryos are brought along. As the first settlers arrive at Delta Pavanus IV, or Eos, the most Earth-like planet in our vicinity, they are tasked with raising large families to populate their new world. Eos is an arid world with 70% of Earth's gravity, lakes, microbial life, and an atmosphere requiring only an oxygen mask for survival, not a whole spacesuit. Early settlers focus on building towns near these lakes, utilizing local resources to establish self-sustaining agriculture and industry. In the 2500s, with humanity settled in several star systems, there is a plethora of economic systems and ways of governing. Starting closest to the sun, this is Mercury, which isn't really a civilization in its own right anymore. The society that developed on Mercury in past centuries has been mostly relocated by today, as the planet has been repurposed as an interplanetary cooperative, namely the Sol System's central assembly point for its millennia-long license warm project. The majority of the population is a mix of scientists and engineers from all over the Sol System, in charge of administering and planning the mostly automated process of dismantling Mercury and using it to build a Dyson Swarm in order to capture a significant portion of the Sun's energy. The project was put into motion 200 years prior to meet humanity's rapidly increasing energy needs. The inhabitants of Mercury were compensated and gradually resettled in their own autonomous Venestats, or floating cities, on Venus, hence the large Mercan-speaking minority on Venus. The Veneran Union has, thanks to advancing technology, become a proper civilization. At first, settlement of Venus was an incredibly expensive venture, as metals and other key resources had to be imported. But by the 2500s, advancements in material science and silicon carbide-based electronics that can handle the heat and enabled surface mining in the hostile environment, making Venusian civilization self-sustaining. Venus is a loose confederation of its many Venestats, which are mostly governed autonomously, with the central government in the Avalon Venestat representing Venus in interplanetary affairs, mediating disputes, and handling planetary defenses. This means its societal metrics are just an average, the overarching government structure is democratic, but there are individual, oligarchic, or even dictatorial Venestats. Economic systems also vary wildly from Venestat to Venestat. The United Nations of Earth and Luna Humanity's cradle has grown to become a very egalitarian society, with some moderate but capped social mobility. While its member nations are still highly autonomous, most have done away with old economic systems and made large-scale industry publicly owned. Democratic socialism, essentially, with some market socialist aspects as well when it comes to smaller ventures. There is moderate but capped social mobility possible through smaller community-driven enterprises and the plethora of jobs that still exist. You can work hard and save enough for a house or a trip to Titan, but you can't own all rocket factories as one person. 
This happened because massive and powerful corporations in the 21st century established oligarchies in significant portions of the world, similar to those of the Gilded Age, and extended their power too far, which was simply not sustainable, as climate change, exploitation of workers, lack of healthcare, and a plethora of issues inevitably led to drastic reform. The oligarchs eventually faced too much opposition from the masses. They were just reaping the benefits of their fully automated corporations, which they had no part in. Some oligarchs fled, establishing their own techno-feudalist and corporatist states on distant asteroids and moons. Mars mirrors Earth in many respects, albeit with a stronger technocratic heritage. Mars used to be a loose collection of former Earth government colonies and corporate technocracies established by the super-wealthy but has over centuries drifted towards more egalitarianism. Its electoral system follows a federal structure with layers of elected bodies. Mars has spent the past two centuries focusing on terraforming efforts. It has thickened its atmosphere to a point where the deepest valleys and craters such as Invalis Marineris and Hellas Planitia reach over 10% of Earth's atmospheric pressure. This remains far from habitable for humans, but is enough to allow liquid water lakes. Here, engineered plants and microbial life thrive, forming the first stable Martian ecosystems, which going forward will play a big role in terraforming planet further. The Jovian Commonwealth is one of the Sol System's more authoritarian states, one of the places where the old oligarchs got their way. Its political structure is somewhat reminiscent of the old Soviet Union, 21st century China, or a large corporation. It technically has democratically elected bodies like the Civic Council, but it is only advisory, with the main seat of power being the Executive Council, equivalent to the Politburo of the USSR or Board of Directors of a company. Life in the Jovian system is harsh by 26th century standards if you're in the lower classes of society, as there is no social mobility outside of extreme luck. The state's primary purpose is to enrich the members of the Executive Council and upper class of a few hundred oligarchs, with the general population being kept uneducated and just content enough as to not rebel. The Union of Titan and the Saturn system, meanwhile, has perhaps the most unique form of government out of the Sol system's major powers. It is a heavily synthetized society, a form of epistocracy, meaning ruled by the knowledgeable, which puts carefully crafted artificial intelligences designed to optimize societal outcomes in charge of government and administration. The system allows for democratic participation, but instead of voting for human representatives, citizens vote to determine which governance algorithms will guide policy and administration. These artificial intelligences are referred to as cognitions. Each cognition represents a distinct philosophical or strategic approach to governance, much like political parties in old-school democracies. Oronos remains an isolated society. It's a federation of Oronos' moons, which generally tries to stay out of interplanetary politics. Its economic and political systems are somewhere in between Mars and Saturn. Cognitions are utilized as administrators, but they don't entirely replace human politicians. The state is a consensus democracy, where Oronos's five largest moons each have an equal vote, and where most system-wide political decisions require a four-fifths majority. The Neptune sovereignty, centered around Neptune's major moon Triton, is an even more isolated society. It was founded by powerful oligarchs and has evolved into an elective dictatorship where the general population does get to vote, but the elected sovereign holds supreme power. This results in a system not too dissimilar to the one in the Jupiter system, where inevitably most elected sovereigns simply spend their term enriching the elite and keeping the general population just barely uninformed and content enough that it isn't a big enough problem for them. Out in the interstellar colonies, there is quite a chaotic scene, very reminiscent of the early Sol system prior to the devastating war between Alara and Lysithea. There are thousands of independent societies all across human inhabited space, but to give a rough idea of the scene, we'll go through the broad coalitions on 26th century Eos. Eos is home to two broad coalitions of societies defined by ideology and established by the old powers of the Sol system. These coalitions are far from cohesive, with member communities frequently switching sides opportunistically. Each are competing to become the primary civilization on Eos and in the Delta Pavanus system. The humanist communities of Eos were largely established by Earth and Mars. They embraced human-centric incorporation of artificial intelligence, using them as tools, in tandem with human thought, through the use of AI companions with immense computing power and access to all public data. The coalition has no central authority or form of government, with everything from corporate oligarchies to direct democracies participating. The Ocean Syntheticist Alliance, meanwhile, embraces the use of cognitions for governing, advanced sentient AIs that are allowed to make decisions independently. The Syntheticist Alliance was established by the most prominent Saturnian settlements on Eos. But that's about all for now. 
Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more content like this. If you enjoyed this, check out part 1 and 2 and my other space-related videos. And consider channel membership if you want to contribute to my projects and get a mention at the end of videos. See you next time.